This is Under the Lid, a rat tail podcast about board games and everything that's inside. Join your hosts, me, Adam Tebow, and Jim Brera with our special guest on episode number three, where we'll dive under the lid of Scythe. Yo, welcome to episode three of Under the Lid. We have a guest today, and the first thing he says to us is like, wow, you guys don't have anything prepared? That's just kind of insulting. But with much further ado, here's our guest today. Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Hey, folks. All right, Aaron, just to start off, I usually like to ask guests questions. So, Aaron, what's your favorite game of all time? Can't change this answer. So once this is locked in, it's just here for life for all our listeners. My favorite board game of all time, I think, might actually be Scythe. Oh, oh, damn. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I didn't know this. This is why we got him on here. <laughs> oh, 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 here we go. <laughs> It's, <laughs> all right, so when we started talking about this, we're actually at the end of what we call the board game weekend on our main feed, right? Adam wasn't able to join us, so Boo. you missed out on all the fun. We got to play a lot of games. Well, not that many games, but a good amount of games. I got to play Great Western Trail. It's been a while since I played. I got destroyed in it. Nice. So did Aaron, actually. No, we both played Great Western Trail. We both lost. Neither of us had an engine going, pun intended, because the train wasn't moving. Oh, no, no, we had our trains moving. Nothing else was moving. That was the day she was. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to play that. I've also played Eminent Domain. I talked about it in the podcast. I love that game. Aaron, you got to play Cryptid, which you own but hadn't gotten to play. Yeah, wait, how was Cryptid? I really enjoyed it. It took me a little bit to get going, like to try to figure it out, get my brain in the mode of like eliminating options. Well, because there's mm-hmm. like, in that game, it's kind of like Clue, right? But it's also like, you have an advanced and a regular version. So a regular version, once you get that, it's pretty straightforward. Like, I think you can play that with basically anyone, the basic. It's when you get to the advanced version where, you, like, there's a little switch that flips that says, like, all right, you can also have, like, the negative of one, which makes, like, the clues half as good every time. So it's just, like, mm. it's hard to, like, try to grasp that mentality. Well, that was what it was my issue when I played the advanced version. It was just, like, I wasn't grasping when people were saying stuff, like, what it actually meant. Okay. Yeah. And then we had Wavelength. You were talking about that game. Yeah. Aaron actually owned it, so he brought it over, so we got to play that. Nice. That was pretty fun. I, I liked it. I believe that one won Party Game of the Year like two years ago, right? Yeah, 2019. Yeah, it was fun. It's very clever. I've never seen a game like that, so I was very happy with it. Yeah, I don't know, so what, much What fun. were your thoughts? Yeah, when I found out about the game, it was like it just seemed like a game that you would normally play with your friends, but now there's some rules around it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to judge something on a scale from this to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. It was pretty funny. Yeah. It was pretty funny. So we got we got some good clues in there. We also did get to play illustrations and game of things, all the classics. We nice. got to learn a lot about like from my little brother Bruno, who's in the podcast before. He taught us about what an, a sigma male was, an alpha, beta, and delta male, I think. So now we're more knowledgeable and woke. P- perfect. How many people were there this weekend? Eight. We had eight, so we got two wow. groups of four going. It was pretty fun. Oh, the other game we got to play was the Wits and Wagers expansion. The Vegas oh, yeah. expansion. <laughs> Dude, oh, so good. <laughs> it improved the game so much. It felt like a casino game. I put some music on the background. And, like, it's a big mat. It's like a big-ass mat. It covers mm. most of the table. Oh, really? And then I, I used real poker chips, so we were all playing with those. It was pretty fun. I, it definitely improved the game. Next time we play Wits and Wagers, you're going to really enjoy this one. Like, they add okay. all these different odds and, like, ways of betting, like, roulette style. Oh, okay. So, it was pretty neat. It was pretty neat. Cool. All right. You guys want to move into Scythe? Wait, was that the only question you had for Aaron was his favorite game? Aaron, if you had to eat one board game, it cannot be a card game, what board game would you eat? There's a game with all these, like, blue crystals that I think I played before. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> you know which ones? Like they're like plastic, like transparent gems. In every game, every, I saw them on Ascension, and then right after Ascension, every other fucking yeah. game had it. You know which one I think would be fun? I think it's like Caverna because there's like all these tiny pieces, but there's just like a shit ton of them. So you're like sitting down for an hour eating this game. What about Feast for Odin? It's literally a feast for yeah. Odin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we we played gizmos yesterday and the marbles oh, okay. were looking pretty good <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice you know what that's a solid one i think kids do eat marbles and you can probably digest those like somewhat safe there's not that many so you're right that's a good choice it's a solid choice all right so why don't we jump into scythe spoiler alert on 
Rise of Fenris. We are going to spoil that. Aaron made fun of us for being unprepared, but luckily he came prepared for us. So he even has like a little, he has an agenda, <laughs> bullet points. Dude, I actually, I'm looking at his notebook right now and there's indentations. Like, you know, you go like a section. All right, Aaron, lead this podcast. Where do you want us to start? I thought we would talk about like what kind of game is Scythe because there's okay. a lot of different components that work together. You know, you know what's kind of interesting? I asked this question to Adam on our last podcast and I said, what are the four X's on 4X stand for? Right? And I think that's what Scythe is, right? So this is Scythe, Jimmy Stegmaier, I don't think we mentioned that, by Stonemaier Games. But Scythe, for me, it's like a 4X games, right? You expand, you exploit, you explore, and you exterminate. So you have combat, you have the exploration aspect of it, you have like the collecting resources, so like resource management, and at the very base of its game is action selection, right? You have four actions to take on your turn, but that's what you choose from. So that's how I would describe Scythe for me. It's like a, it's a 4X game with like action selection as its main root mechanic. But it, when people think of 4X, they think of much longer and heavier games. So I think it did a good job of really streamlining a lot of that. I think th- really through the encounters that they did. I think that really helps accelerate the game, and I think it kind of adds... You know, you still get that explore kind of aspect of it, but really accelerates your your game position. We're probably going to be talking about how much we like the game or dislike the game and stuff, but I remember the very first time I played it, the thing that actually put me off from this game was because I went in thinking, okay, this is a 4X game. I'm thinking Twilight Imperium, Eclipse, Mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then I play this, and I'm like, wow, the rules are way too simple. Not in, like, (laughs) they're super simple, right? It's just like very streamlined rules like mm-hmm. oh it's just four actions and they do literally what you do in a 4x game and then it's just like in the play time was like an hour and a half to maybe two hours mm-hmm. just that's what threw me off a little bit i was like this is like really streamlined i didn't like that now the more i play it it's just i kind of like that because it's so easy to set up and just get going with any group of people yeah so aaron what were you thinking the type of game this was i don't know if you guys would be surprised but board game geek calls it an engine building game we had an episode about engine building, actually, right? And I mm-hmm. did not think of Scythe as an engine building game. What engine are you building? I guess you upgrade the board to help better... I don't know. Dude, you're building mechs. Is that what you're saying, Aaron? We're building mechs? They have <laughs> engines? <laughs> no, I, did, I wasn't sure if it was an engine building game or not either. It seems more like an engine tuning game or an engine mm-hmm. like maintenance game. Okay, all right. Can we just mm-hmm. say, I want to coin those terms for the Rattail podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, think that's a, those are so, I don't think I've ever heard those names <laughs> being discussed in board games, but I agree with you. That's like, that's such a good description. Like it's definitely engine maintenance or engine tuning. Like you're making it slightly better. The engine's already there. You're just making it a slightly better and then you're upkeeping it. Mm-hmm. That's funny. That's yeah, a, I like that's that. That's a good like analogy, that. yeah. Well, I think it kind of brings up, like, what exactly is an engine building game and, like, why doesn't Scythe feel like, exactly like it fits that category? It's the drastic change. So for, uh, we, when we had the episode about engine building games, we were talking about, like, growth and, like, how you, you start with, like, a certain small engine, something that converts something from A to B, and then it grows into something way more complex. Scythe doesn't really do that. There is some growth, but it's in the growth of, okay, I already have some of these pieces, so I'm just making them slightly better. So mm-hmm. we just played Gizmos, right? We talked about Gizmos. Gizmos, an engine, I feel like it's an engine building game because you have that, right? You start off with, like, here's some basic actions, and then every time you do something, it just goes over the top with everything else. I like the idea of engine maintenance and engine tuning as explaining to Scythe because the engine is already there. You're just making it slightly better every time you take one of your actions. Well, yeah, exactly. That's it. But every time you remove something from your board, an action that you can take gets better. Even the empower, like you get a one-off bonus, but then you get a bonus for the rest of the game whenever somebody else does that in bottom level action. So I think that there's a lot there that goes into making the game progressively better every time you take that action. Because the action you take on turn one is not the same action you take on turn 10. And every upgrade that you take and every empower action that you take and every mech that you build, you know, they all unlock something that makes one of the four actions that you take a little bit better. Yeah, I guess. I I still wouldn't say it's an engine building. I I, I like the idea of engine tuning or engine engine maintenance. Yeah, I Uh, agree. So, yeah, I, I think it's just more 4X. Like, that's the, literally the most basic 4X game or, like, a very basic 4X game you can get. I think you get Scythe. 
All right, let's go through the, the outline that Aaron here has. Aaron, where, where's your uh, syllabus taking us? I guess we'll go through the basic gameplay, the steps of the turn. Right. So here's where I was talking about how Scythe is just so basic. A lot of the games have very different approaches to gameplay. And this one is just an action selection of four different actions. So everyone's going to be Delta Faction that's like asymmetrical powers, right? Some sort of like bonus you get. But then everyone has a board. And the player board is the one that has your actions in it. The player board is divided into four different actions. And then each action has a top action and a bottom action. And everyone has the same actions on the top and bottom, except they're shuffled together. So every player board has the same actions just shuffled together. So your top and bottom action might be different than someone else's top and bottom action combination. Your top actions, bolster, trade, produce, and move. So those are pretty basic. So I'll just start with move. You basically move around the board. In, in Scythe, you have three types of characters you can move. You have your main character who can kind of like get special abilities and he can just move around and you collect encounters he can get into combat with. Then you have your max, right? That's like the big, nice miniature. And they also get the special powers like the character card and they get to move around. But they also have the ability to carry your ground units, which are your workers. So that third figure you can move is your workers. And those are the guys you're going to be using for producing. So you move your workers around in different territories and different territories produce different things, right? And then like we said, one of the actions is produced. So you select certain territories you have your workers in and those territories produce. There's also bolsters. So like I said, the main character and your mechs can get into combat. Not the workers, but those figures can get into combat. And you can bolster and it's a way to get powers. Because the combat in this game is pretty simple. You play a power card or like a combat card and it has a number. And then you also get to secretly bid what's called like your power which you get more through bolsters on the board the game is pretty easy to tell if you can win or not you can look at the board and be like all right if i get in a combat with aaron i can guarantee my win or i can try to risk it and save a couple of my resources to not fully win and then the last one you can do is trade which is just another way to produce is you you instead of producing the resources you just buy them the other cool thing I want to mention before I go into like the bottom actions is you can also carry the resources on the map, right? So the resources don't go into your supply. They actually are on the board. So people can actually steal your resources from the board. I haven't really seen that in any other game, really. And last is just the bottom actions. There's upgrade, which means take a cube from the top action. There's all your top actions have different cubes blocking some of the areas. So by removing a cube, you usually make the top action better. And then all the bottom actions have a cost and you can put a cube to cover some of the costs and so now they're cheaper for the rest of the game. So upgrade basically makes your top actions better and your bottom actions cheaper. There's deploy, which is how you make mechs in this game. So you, you can make up to four mechs. Every time you make a mech, you unlock a special ability that's given to the mech and to your player character. There's also build. You can build up to four buildings. Each building does something different and they usually they're in place on the top row. And then you get to put them out on the board. The important thing to note here is kind of like Terra Mystica style where the buildings or the cubes, they actually reveal something else and now you get a special ability. There's also Enlist. Enlisting is a little disc you actually remove from the bottom and you get a one-time bonus with that disc. And not only that, you also get a benefit now that every time you or a neighbor takes that bottom action, you're going to get some sort of benefit. So those are the four actions. On your turn, you select one of those four nations, a top and bottom action. They're, again, they're preset by the player board. Yeah, and you can alternatively do the top and the bottom or one or the other. You don't have to do both. At the beginning, you won't be able to do both. And in most cases, you probably won't be able to do both either. Yeah, the one thing I did forget to mention, by the way, was the way the game ends, right? There's certain victory conditions where every time you meet one of those, you get to put one star into them. The moment you put all of your six stars out, you end the game, not necessarily win. And then the way you score is by multipliers. So there's like three tiers that score. The first tier is how many stars you get. Then the second tier is how many territories you have. And the third tier is how many resources you have. And then there's this thing called reputation in the game where you can increase your reputation to increase those multipliers for the end of the game. And there's also a way that you decrease that reputation by attacking workers, which are non-combat units. You're actually getting penalized for those. During the attacks, attackers win draws, which is a big deal. Most games actually, it's usually the opposite, right? It's the, the defenders win the draw. But in this case, the attackers, which kind of makes sense because you have to be sure you can win the fight. And fight is not really pushed in this game too much because 
it only gives you at most two stars. So once you get the two stars in, you don't really need to fight anymore. And it's kind of a risk of losing your resources. Imagine if it was Ty goes to the defense, then nobody would fight. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you already don't want to fight that much in this game. So, all right. So that's that's the main mechanic breakdown. What I wanted to just briefly discuss then before we jump into the other stuff that we, and I'm sure we want to talk a lot about like the factions. We want to talk about like the expansions and stuff in the legacy version. I wanted to talk briefly about the artwork and the components. So the artwork is, I'm going to, hold on. I'm going to read his name to the public. Publicly shame this guy. Jacob okay. Rosalski. And Jacob Rosalski had that scandal. That's right. There was a board game scandal with this game because a lot of people caught a lot of his paintings being tracings. Right. So he was taking artwork from other artists and painting over it, still giving it its, his own look and style. But he was definitely like just painting over other people's artwork. So it was like a big controversy. Jamie said he looked into it, but in reality, I don't think there was much coming out. It wasn't anything that he did was illegal, right? Because he actually improved on a lot of the paintings and stuff. But a lot of the people didn't like that. And I guess in his like streaming channels and stuff, he would say how he did all his painting freehand, even though he was tracing Mm -hmm. it. So that was some of the drama that was there. Well, I will say I remember first impressions, like first time I ever saw it. It was incredible. I mean, the map is huge. And he had a lot of minor detail that made the map look really good and make it look, you know, like a a world. There was different sections of the world with different climates and different terrain. And I thought it looked really good. It wasn't just, you know, like Settlers of Catan style thing where each hexagon has like its own isolated thing. And then they just like pasted hexagons together, you know, kind of thing. It all seamlessly blended between all of the different factions, even though they all live in relatively different climates. Yeah, it's not my favorite type of artwork, but it's really well done. And I think the components are already Stone Meyer games, so you know you're going to get good components. But the miniatures are beautiful. He actually released a metal miniature, so if you wanted to play yeah, with metal miniatures, you can. And then he introduced different map sizes. You can get the smaller map or the bigger map or like a neoprene mat. So there's a lot to add up to this game to make it pretty. The game, like on the table, I have not seen a game that looks this good. Yeah, Aaron, what are your first impressions and what do you own? Yeah, when I first saw this game, I was pretty amazed. Uh, This is actually like one of my favorite kinds of art. Something that seems mundane and boring. But if you look a little bit closely, there's like a little touch of whimsy in there. And I I think that captures it well, although I don't really support the the tracing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think also cool about the map is there's also like other little secrets in the map too. So you included Easter eggs. I think there's a Santa Claus (laughs) and a sore. There's like a Sasquatch, I think, in the bottom at some point. And I think the Red Riding Hood's there, I, I, I believe. Like I say, it's like a huge map. So like there's very tiny little details there that are pretty neat. All right. So we're going to talk about the factions. So he's got to check his yeah, notes Yeah, we got to consult the notes. Uh, we cannot deviate from the notes. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, where does the note take us? <laughs> but yeah, we can, we can move to factions. So I'll, I'll describe the factions. You know what's funny? Uh, the reason Aaron came with notes, and he was he actually, when we were getting ready for this podcast, he the big box, and he was like, yeah, you know, I've been calling these factions like Russia and like <laughs> Albany. So I was like, all oh, right, that's what I call them. That's not actually the name <laughs> of the factions. <laughs> It's always, it's the yellow faction. All right, wait, 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 before we go, each of us, let's go around the table and try to guess them. All right, why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? I'm going to have the rule book. Okay. Then you guys have to tell me what the faction is. And, and here's how we'll do it. Well, you tell me the faction and you tell me the mascot, right? So they all each have an animal too. Oh, wait, so, so it's, hey, hey, no cheating. Wait, it's Aaron. just Aaron and I now? <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, it's just Aaron and well, I only guys, know one. I'm going to look like, <laughs> I need to look like a professional. So... Unless you want to do it, doesn't no, matter. No, I, I, okay. I doesn't. No, I, right. I, why don't we all three all right, do guys, it? So we'll, eh, no, no, I'll just read the <laughs> answers because I got the rule book in front of me. <laughs> okay. So, all right, let's start with the red faction. We'll go with Aaron first. Aaron, what do you think the name of the red faction is, and what do you think the mascot is? Is it? Do you want the name of the mascot? No, no, it's just the animal. <laughs> oh. What do you think the animal is, and what the name of the faction is? I can tell you, it's the red faction, which is a star. The symbol's a star. It, that one is clearly based on Russia yes. or the Soviet <laughs> yeah. Union. And I think it's like Rusviet. I don't know the second word. It's like Rusviet Syndicate or something like that. The mascot is a tiger. All right, Adam, what are you thinking? I think he's right with Rusviet, but I thought it was the bear. All right. I forgot my little ding in Buster, <laughs> but it's okay. The answer is the Rusviet or Rusviet Union. So it's there. So you guys got that. 
and it is a tiger. Okay. Adam, come on, man. All right. Now, Adam, you're going to go first on this mm-hmm. one. So we're going to go to the blue faction. The symbol for this faction is actually Mjolnir from Thor. It's a hammer. So this is the blue faction. What is the name and mascot? I think this one, it's like the Nordic one. But I think it was called Polonia. Maybe this one's the one with the bear. I'm just going to keep guessing the bear until I get the bear. <laughs> <laughs> what is the mascot of your bear? <laughs> All right, what are you thinking, Aaron? Uh, this one is the Nordic something, and it's a yak or a muskox. Oh, yes. All right, so I guess this is Aaron's favorite game because it is Nordic. <laughs> so you guys were both on Nordic, but you gave it a different name. <laughs> so the faction is Nordic Kingdoms or Nordic. And, yeah, it's like the buffalo-looking thing. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. It. yeah, yeah, it's like with, like, the horns on the side. So, yeah, that's what it is. All right. Jumping at Aaron again. This is the yellow faction. The yellow faction has the horse, has the logo. So what do you think the yellow faction's name is and mascot? I don't remember the name of this one at all. I always associate it with like southeastern Europe, like maybe around Turkey. I know it's a bird, but not sure what kind of bird either. <laughs> all right, what are you thinking, Adam? I, I'm just guessing what names I know, and this hasn't been said yet. So I think Polonia this one's called the bear. Albion. <laughs> I think this one's called Albion. And I think this one... It's a bear. No, it's not the bear. <laughs> I know this one's not the bear. I do think I remember that. It's the the standee is the lady with the, the bird on her, on her hand. Because she's the one that has to go get the extra encounters, right? I think this is the one that does two encounters. It can choose two of the three options. This one is like Crimea. Ah, Crimea. Crimea faction. Okay. So Crimean... Cabinate, it's a full name. And yes, it's a lady with the eagle, I think, or it's like a hawk. Or it's a pretty big hawk. All right. This is the white faction with the faction symbol being a bear. So who's this? Adam first now? All right. So Adam. <laughs> faction symbol's a bear. All right. So it's a white faction with a bear right. faction this one, symbol. This one I'm going what? horse. And I'm going to say, no. <laughs> This one, I, I think maybe this one's Polonia then with the bear. Aaron, agree, disagree? Yeah, this is Polonia with the bear. And I actually remember the name of this one. The name of the bear is Wajtek. Uh-huh. Because, and I remember this because there was actually a bear named Wajtek in the Polish army at some point. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. It might not have been Poland specifically. It might have been Russia instead. But I know that there was a bear in an army named Wajtek. In real life history, they did their research. That's cool. They did their research. Yeah. All right. So this is Republic of Polonia. So yes, Polonia, and it obviously is the bear. Yes, and it's yeah, it's Anna and Wojtek. It's the name of I guess the leader and the bear. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Next, the black faction, whose symbol is a wolf. Aaron. So this is a wolf symbol. So what do you think it is? (laughs) Yeah. Well, the mascot is a wolf, and it's a Saxony empire i think what are you thinking adam just sticking to whatever aaron says i swear one was called albion but apparently i might be wrong you know i'm gonna say this one to albion all right i don't know where this guy's getting his like knowledge from <laughs> Dude, if you're gonna cheat at least cheat properly <laughs> so the faction is the saxonic empire okay. and it is the the, the black wolf is uh, gunter natch and tag is the name of the the leader in the wolf all right, guys, expansion time. Oh, man. Scythe Base has five <laughs> factions. There's two factions in one expansion and then two more factions on the next expansion. Next one is, I'm going to not even say what the symbols are anymore. So I'm going to say, what's the green faction? So I stopped giving away the answer. What's the green faction? Adam. I don't even know. I know that the this one, ugh, I don't even remember if this one's the, the flags of the traps. It's been a while since I've played Scythe, especially with the expansion. I like how Adam like remembers the characters by the abilities, not by like the lore <laughs> of the game. It's just like this is the one with disability. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna call them the flag bearers, and it's snake. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, what do you think? I shouldn't participate. I just read it before we started. Adam, this is the Albion. Fuck! Oh my god! <laughs> I swear, I knew there was one. Yeah. <laughs> this is Clan Albion, and it's the Warthog with the flags. So he's the one that does the flags. Oh, my God. Yeah. This is terrible. So that's that's uh, Connor and Max. That's the name of the mascot and the leader. All right. So then 
This is to you, Aaron. Do, unless you want, you, you'd write this one too? Uh, yeah. Okay, so Adam. Oh, Jesus Christ. Aaron's cheating. <laughs> what is the purple faction's name? Well, good well this is the one with the one. traps. I know that. I don't know. Slovia. What's the animal? Fucking snake. <laughs> the fuck, dude? There's no snakes in this game. <laughs> no, this one has a frog. I'm certain. Is it? I don't think Adam's ever played Scythe. I think this is the first time he's played it. All right. So this is the Togawa Shogunate, and it's a monkey. It was a monkey? Yeah. It's a monkey. She has Where? a monkey on her shoulders. Oh, it's super okay. cool. All right. Wait, wait. Before we move on, can we, like... I know you guys have mentioned this on another episode, but what do you think about Scythe? The map has these expansion factions already mm. on mm-hmm. there, but they don't come with the base game. I'm glad you brought that I'm up, Aaron. Wondering. You know, here's what we're going to do. I got a big ramp. So let's finish up this okay. because then I got to rant about this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we'll do this is the last two factions. These are factions that are the ones located in the Rise of Fenris expansion. So now we're back to Aaron. Aaron. What is the light blue faction? Name and mascot. I don't know what the name of the faction is, but it's supposed to be Nikola Tesla's daughter. And that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the name, yeah, the name was like a female name, I think, because I think this is the one I actually ended up playing in the, in the campaign. I think it actually started with an N, too, but I don't remember her name. Do you remember the mascot? I didn't even know she had one. That was just like her. <laughs> <laughs> all right so the answer you're looking for is vesna which is the tesla fa- it's, it's the vesna faction but it says tesla on the faction but it's we, they call it Vesna on the rule book and it's a mechanical wolf so it's like a wolf that's like oh. a slightly blue pattern okay okay yep yep all right guys and then the last faction is the orange faction why do you guys think it's the orange faction remember the story this one is nikola tesla right mech version of him or something like that this is the guy you have to like fight at the end, right, or something. Somebody gets to be coming for like just the last scenario or two scenarios or something. I think you get this one around like scenario six. I don't know what the mascot is though. A Tesla coil. <laughs> Aaron, do you have any idea on this one? Uh, I think this one is Rasputin, but I don't know his faction name <laughs> or his <laughs> companion. <laughs> All right, guys, this is Fenris. This is like oh, the expansion's name after. Him. Oh. <laughs> You fucked. But it is Rasputin. And uh, oh, I believe he has like a okay. hawk. I, I, yeah, like another bird. So he is Rasputin, in fact. I, I lost the page, but yes, he's Rasputin. Oh, wait, so do you fight at the... In the last scenario you fight Tesla? What, when do you fight? So Tesla shows up. I forgot why. There's a miniature of Tesla. But this is a guy with the giant mechs, right? Like uh, the yeah, 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 over. yeah, yeah. Like, you I played with him, I think. Those our... Yeah. They're, they're, he's the one that starts with all the negative points uh-huh. on the player mat. I love the mechs, but they're so like tall that they tip over so easily. So yeah, this is Rasputin and Lickho. Oh no, sorry. I think it's an owl. It's not a bird. It's an owl. Not just a bird. It's a thing. It's an owl. I think I remember in the scenario you had to like go to the middle and there was a box and then you open the box and it was a giant fucking mech, and then you had to beat the yeah. mech in order yeah, to yeah, win. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. So we had to fight the mech, but then after you fight the mech, you unlock the faction, mm-hmm. which we'll go through like the the campaign. All right. Why don't I just do a quick rant real quick? I talked about it before. If you already have this idea for the expansion, why not just include it? That's my thing. I get it. Maybe if he was trying to save money, you know, by adding two more factions, maybe it'll drive the price a little too high. Mm-hmm. And you don't really need all seven to play because you only really are playing a five-player game at most. So maybe that's why he didn't include it. I'm not a fan. I don't like when people do it. I can see it, though, especially if a game like this where, like, the home territory is already identified at the beginning of the game. You kind of want to have that pre-planned, right? So if you're going to have some faction, might as well just have it all planned out and not fuck yourself over later by not including those in the beginning. Yeah, cause, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, you'd have to re-release a new map with the expansion. I mean, I understand why he did it. And it's all basically because, like, board games are trying to fit this price point that video games have fit into for the last five years. And they n- realize they're competing with them, which makes sense, but... Personally, like I said on the last on a recent episode, I'd rather just pay eighty five to ninety bucks and have it come with the first expansion and the base game. Just have it all in one big box. It's not even about paying more money. Like it's not even about oh MSRP for Scythe is sixty and MSRP for Evaders from Afar is like thirty five or forty. It's not even about that. It's more about the fact that like I'd rather just have them come together 
and get a more complete experience in one box. Even if you charge me more than they are separate, I don't care. I'd rather just have it all together. What are you thinking, Aaron? Yeah, I I see both points of view. One thing that makes me think a little bit about, like, if I wanted to buy these separately, like, holding off on the expansion, is the fact that the expansions for Invaders from Afar play a little differently from the other ones. A lot different. And sometimes it feels like they don't quite mesh well. Yes. I remember the first time I played a game with Invaders from Afar expansions, and I just, it felt like I was playing against Scythe for the first time, because I really didn't understand how the factions were going to interact with the existing factions and how the factions were going to behave on their own. Like Aaron said, they're so different from what you would expect from the normal five factions in the game that it's just a completely different game when they're interacting with the game. Which, I mean, is a good thing. I mean, that's what you're going for, right? You want to, after you've been playing Scythe for a whole year, year and a half or whatever, or two years, you want to have that refreshing, like, new take on the game and be able to experience it kind of new again. That's why I like what Rise of Fenry said, because, yeah, you're right, the Invaders from Afar expansions, way different. So I was like, okay, that's cool. You're not doing the same fucking shit. Okay, let me sit in one spot, play there for four turns, and then try to jump off. It was like, all right, you have availability to the map. You just don't have speed, so you have to play mm-hmm, it differently. Mm-hmm. And then Rise of Fenry did it even more hardcore, where they're like, okay, here's two new factions that also play completely different. Like, they mm-hmm. really don't follow that pattern. So they, I do enjoy the way the expansions were released. I, I can see, like, what Aaron said, like, okay, these are really different expansions. So maybe you don't want to necessarily with the same expansions because the asymmetry is, like, a significant amount. They're definitely harder to play. Like, I think it's definitely harder to play with all four newer ex- factions than they are with the base factions, mm-hmm. which are not that straightforward. We can actually just jump into factions, at the, I guess, at this point. So what I'll do, let's go to the factions, right? Mm-hmm. And then we'll talk about which ones we like, what we dislike, and... Do we think some of them are overpowered or anything like that, right? Like like any other game with asymmetrical powers, that's the issues that you mm-hmm. have. All right. So, you guys guessed the factions. I was impressed with that, uh, Aaron. I was, yep. <laughs> I, I was amused with Adam, <laughs> I guess you can say. All right. So, Black Faction, which is Saxony, they have the ability that there's no limit to the number of stars you can place from completing objectives and winning combat. So, mono aggro. Rustiate, which is red is you may choose the same section on your player mat has the previous turns. So you can choose the same action multiple times. Is Rusviet the only faction that has a configuration that's banned? I think there were two factions. Aaron wrote them down. What the fuck? We wrote them down for our Rise of Fenris campaign, and I just found the sheet we wrote them on. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) So Rusviet is right. You cannot have the player mat that's industrial. What's the other banned one? So the other one is Crimea. Which is the, uh, I'll just jump to that one, right? The yellow faction is Crimea, which is once oh, per yeah. turn. You may spend one combat card as if it were one resource token. Uh-huh. So Crimea cannot be with Patriotic. And that was actually, what's funny about that one is, that, like, I think that was, like, the fans found that, that they were a little too overpowered. And then Jamie actually addressed it in the Rise of Fenris book, that you shouldn't play with those two together. There's the Nordic, which is the blue. Those are your workers may move across rivers. Yeah, so you got swimming. Swimmers. Yeah. Woo! That one's always funny. Yeah. That's always funny because you can get so far on the map. And like, again, we have that population mechanic where, like, if you kill workers, you lose population. So you're like, come at me, bro. Yep. The next one is Polonia, which is white. Is You can pick up the two options per encounter card. So those are the base ones, right? Again, nothing too game-breaking or different. Then there's the Clan Albion, which is the green faction, which is after moving your character, you may place a flag token on its territory. And again, the mech abilities on this one lets you like teleport to flags, and then flags are actually the kind of territories you control at the end of the game. The Togawa Shognate, which is purple, has the ability to, after moving your character, you may place an arm trap token on its territory. And very similarly, you can unlock more abilities for your trap tokens with by building mechs. And these, like the tokens, are basically all negative effects when someone lands on them. So your place of mines are around the board. Mm-hmm. Then there's Vesna, who's the light blue faction from Rise of Fenris. I started the game with three factory cards. After you use a factory card, including one acquired from the factory, discard it. And I believe this one, you also have to fill it up with abilities for your mechs. Like, it doesn't have yes. all the abilities. Two of them are not there. Yeah. yeah. So, and then lastly, it's the orange faction, which is Fenris. I guess from the Rise of Fenris and... Uh, after moving your character, you may place one influence token on its territory. You may then place one more token on any other occupied tokenless. 
primary ter terrain territory. So basically, this character starts with all these influence tokens that are negative points. So if he starts the game with like negative 16 points or something, but has to move around, you actually get to spread them out to other places so people end up getting them. Kind of like the traps that the purple faction has. All right, so I'll start. Favorite faction? I don't know. I kind of like factions that don't give me too much an advantage. Like I like the green faction because I think it's kind of weird to play it. Like I think the yellow faction for me was kind of like, I played it a lot, but it felt like, too straightforward to like okay it's just like i can always do this like I, I like factions like the blue faction or the green faction where like all right what do i do with this ability how do i actually make it work as opposed to something that's always beneficial no matter what you do right like oh choose two encounters i mean two options to encounter i think that's just too straightforward like what the benefit is i'd rather have it to work to get me the benefit so i would go with either the green faction or maybe the blue one but probably the green why don't we go with aaron I think my favorite <laughs> faction is the white one, Polania, that lets you choose two The options. one I was just bitching about? <laughs> yeah. It just seems like you get a really huge advantage if you get the right card. I don't know. I like to play a little more like, I was going to say janky, and I don't know if that applies <laughs> here. But I, I like to take like a little bit more of a chance with things like that. Not so much attacking and stuff, but when you can kind of roll the dice on something, it, it's really satisfying to like get a mech for free because you could choose two of the options that allowed you to do that. And I also like the they can submerge and teleport using the lakes when you release one of your mechs, and that one's really useful too. All right, Adam, which one's yours? Yeah, I think for me, actually, black and white are very close for me as my favorites as well. And I really like the white faction for a slightly different reason than what Aaron said. I like snowballing to be able to assert dominance on the map and start attacking. And it allows you to, having the two Put different <laughs> having the two different encounter options allows you to accelerate your game faster and get more resources quicker, which allows you to take a bigger advantage on the map quicker. And then the black one, same kind of the same idea. I like to take the quick advantage on the map. It's more focused for me that I can just focus on the attacking and get out there and start disrupting other people's games so that I don't have to think too much about making my own strategy or anything like that. I can just, you know, kind of disrupt everybody else's strategy and hopefully win off that. I really... Oh, are we doing dislike or no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Tell the hate. <laughs> I dislike the blue faction and the red faction i guess i haven't played enough with the expansion factions to have a formulated opinion so i guess i'm just going with base game i guess i'm ambivalent towards the yellow and then the the blue and the green i don't i dislike the blue i think it's just harder for me to grasp maybe or it's because it, you're trying to gain an advantage through production and sitting back because the workers can swim so you can get access to all of the different resources that you need that's a more like passive game style in my opinion and that is something that i don't enjoy and then the red one it's more focused on like getting to the factory very quickly because it has the warp that lets you go to the factory with the mech and the factory allows like an alternative for a different way to gaining one of the basically do one of your four bottom actions on your regular card through a different means with different resources and i don't really enjoy that part of the game either because it's more solitaire i guess and more of uh, increasing my advantage instead of decreasing everybody else's advantage. You wanna go, are we going backwards? You wanna, Aaron, you want to go next? Which ones do you hate? Yeah, I dislike the red faction as well. I don't like the mechanic where you can choose the same thing twice in a row. I feel like it's kind of like the whole game is choosing the order of actions to take. And it, it kind of like makes it into a different game where... I think it kind of like baits you into choosing something twice in a row and that might not be the right action to take. And so it kind of becomes almost like a crutch, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, so me. Mine is actually the orange faction, Fenris, from the Rise of Fenris. Mainly because it's like every time I play that faction, I don't get it. I don't get how to win it. It's like, oh, here's, you have to be aggressive. Like I read the strategy tip, it's like, you have to be aggressive. And so I was like, yeah, but I can only move every other move and i like every mm -hmm. time you move i can try to take some of these tokens out but i can never get enough tokens out and it has that ability to leap which is kind of neat i like the leaping that like okay you just because you're such a tall mech you just walk over instead of like having to cross but i think 
that disadvantage of 16 negative, or I forgot how many, but it's a good amount of negative points right on your board, right at the beginning of the game. It's just too fucking harsh to get rid of. Like the, the game never lasted long enough for me to be like, all right, I'm going to remove enough of these to like penalize other players. Or I don't know if it's like they're there to, because the faction, maybe they think it's too strong. In which case they're like, okay, here's how we balance the faction. The faction is too strong, so here's some negative points to balance it out. But I never felt like it was that strong. So I, it's more like a personal opinion of like, I just played it a good a couple of times, and I just I'm not getting how to win with it. So I just end up leaping around the board and just giving maybe one or two negative points to maybe like two players, and then that's it. Does this one have modular? mech abilities too or no this one does not have modular mech abilities no it does not okay so why don't we talk about let's just do really quickly what mechanics you like and if there's any mechanics you dislike i think that would be a good one so again i'll I'll just start over and then we can jump i think to maybe to the expansions all right so mechanics that i like i love the player board Uh, i don't know if it's a mechanic but i love the way he set up the player board to be like all right you just do the top and bottom action again it's so easy to explain and then it gives you kind of a goal to like either upgrade your pieces or use the enlist or like make the buildings and they all somehow relate to your player board Mm -hmm. so i really like the way that's set up i really enjoy that the one that i don't like is enlisting i don't like the way enlisting works in this game just because it gives you the one-time benefit which is always useful but it also feels kind of like patched on it felt like all right he wants you to make buildings he wants you to make mechs he wants you to upgrade and then he ran out of ideas so he's like oh shit i need a fourth bottom action so i guess we're gonna call him enlisting something and then that's how he came up with the mechanic it feels like everything else a little more tight the buildings might not be as tightly connected to the other mechanics but they're a little bit more so i think than the enlist are and i, I get the point of the enlist it's like oh, what people are going to be doing next to me but for me it felt like more of an afterthought and i felt like there was maybe another different type of infrastructure he could have created for a fourth area to look into. Why don't we jump to you, Adam? I really like the resources. I like how they're on the ground or on the table instead of like going into your own resource pool. I think that was a really unique and, and interesting idea, and it adds a lot to the tension. You know, we talked a little bit about earlier about how the tie goes to the attacker, and that's because they're, it, to encourage so much attacking. I think also putting the resources on the board encourages a lot more tacking as well. And I think that those are really necessary for this game to work the way that it does. And I think that he did a really good job with that. And it's very, very unique. It makes a very interesting gameplay. Something that I don't like, I think, for me, is the factory cards. Because I do like the enlisting ability. And I don't like that the factory cards kind of give you like a, a roundabout way to get done the goals of the game. And that I also talked, we talked about this on a different podcast too. I don't like how the factory itself is worth three different territories on its own. Aaron, what do you like and what do you hate? I like the main basic mechanic, the four action selections. I think that really does a good job, like breaking down a whole bunch of different options into like four choices that you can really plan pretty far ahead within reason because someone's always gonna attack you when you don't want them to (laughs) and i'm not sure if there's anything that i really dislike other than maybe like the expansion factions like they feel like they just move a little too slow and then the reputation mechanic is just it's tough to work with reputation can really make or break a game Mm -hmm. if you have good reputation it can really set you up for a win even if you don't have six stars and it's a little tough to keep that reputation up that's fair i like how aaron started that sentence like i don't know if there's anything i dislike but here let me get going (laughs) (laughs) there's this mechanic this is what i'm Uh, here this is factions so talking about expansion unless somebody else has something to say about mechanics if you want to maybe want to jump to expansions yeah go ahead and jump to expansions that sounds good all right so you brought up the expansions i do think they move slower the expansions like have a tendency to be a, a little more aggressive i think Apart from Vesna, I think all the other green, purple, and light blue tend to be more aggressive. But they are handicapped for that aggressiveness, right? Like, you, you don't have that speed, so you have to work off teleporting off your locations. But even when you teleport off your location, you only get that one movement, right, to teleport. So it is a little tougher. 
Well, that's on purpose, right? Because they don't have to upgrade anything in order to get access to the factory. Exactly. Yeah, they they can they don't have to like river walk. Mm-hmm. So it is on purpose, but it, I think it ends up hurting it throughout the game. I think they're still balanced because I've seen people win with all the expansions. So the first expansion is like I want to talk about Invaders from Afar. It just had those two extra factions. So it doesn't really add anything else. We kind of already talked about that. Does it add encounter cards or no? No. Okay. No. So basically what I was going to ask, do you think it's worth getting the Invaders from Afar? My answer is yes, because I think it completes at least the set, the base map. So you have multiple options of expansions. So I would say, yes, I would recommend getting Invaders from Afar. Adam, do you recommend it? I think it's good for people that have played a lot of Scythe. Because I think it adds a lot of variability just with the two different factions. It kind of refreshes the game a little bit. You get a new playthrough experience. But if you're buying it for the first time, I wouldn't buy it with the expansion right away. Okay. Aaron, what are your thoughts? I would recommend it too. Basically for the reasons you guys said. One thing I'd kind of like to see them add, I don't know if this is something that's doable or not. Uh, I know there's another, it might be a fan-made expansion that changes the starting locations of the board. Okay. Oh, oh, Aaron, I got a surprise for you. Huh? I got a surprise oh. for you. Well, o- open up. My thought. <laughs> I was going to say, so, once so... you're done with that thought, open up that white box next to you. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. But anyway... I would like to see them, you know how in Seven Wonders you have your tableau and then you have two different sides Mm -hmm. and the two different sides work a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I would kind of like to see them add that for the factions. So you have one side and then you flip it over and there's a different mechanic. Oh. And then maybe some slightly different mech powers. Okay. And so just like kind of mix it up a little bit. And then if you have different starting positions, then maybe you can have a... Maybe a faster mode of the Invaders from Afar expansion factions. They kind of did that on the Rise of Fenris, though, right? Because they do the... If you choose War, you can change some of your mech abilities, right? You start upgrading your mech abilities. So you can always, like, somewhat choose. I think it is there has a module. Because you can play Rise of Fenris as modules. And I think they do have that one there. How would you do that in-game, I guess? Like, would you have to pay money for it? or No, there's rules for it tells you how to do it so i don't know if you track them or something but there's rules that you can actually so it's from the beginning of the game it's not in mid game it's not mid game but there is a module to play with them so like in the rule book it tells you how to add them into just a game without the expansion okay so i'm not sure how to do it because i've only done it through the expansion where you have to like build up to it i'm gonna jump to this next expansion just because aaron brought it up so the the last expansion from scythe was a modular board and random starting positions it has mixed reviews because of the game is balanced right to like each faction starting position right so like the game is balanced to each starting faction but this one actually shuffles that up so you actually shuffle up the board so that is available i haven't played it i can't recommend it or not but it is something like what aaron said it's like i want to play it just to see okay let's change it up a little bit leaning towards is probably not super balanced because of like the way it works because you know you, you want specific things with certain factions but you know, it, it is something interesting to, to look into. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on this one. I don't think any of us has gotten to actually try the modular board. You should not mix the base factions with the expansion factions if you're doing random on the board because of what we talked about. Because if your base faction has speed and they can just get to the factory so quick. I don't know if he mentioned anything about that like in his official release of the expansion, but I just it feels like it's too strong. Unless you're just playing like two-player and you both want to just do it then fine whatever but the expansion factions are there for a reason like they don't have speed so they can't get to the factory so fast but having a base faction have that advantage over another base faction that's stuck behind a river i think would be very big difference yeah i'd have to see how that's planned out all right so why don't we move to the next expansion which is the wind gambit Mm -hmm. this one added the big ships that fly around every game the ships have a slightly different ability and for the most part they're not super influential they're a little more in the background but they still like can help you out in the in a pinch it also added alternative end conditions so it added like some cards you can play that like might modify the game slightly i'm I'm not a big fan of this expansion every time i play i never really play with the ships because it's just like it adds one extra rule for no real reason and then you're like all right how do i fit it in so for me this one's a pass i mean i have it because i'm a completionist and i just want to have all of them 
but I not once have I been like, all right, I really want to play with the ship expansion. I don't know if anybody else has different opinions on this one. This would be the first expansion I would buy. If I were buying the base game, I would actually buy this expansion with it. Just to contradict me? No, just because I think that it adds. <laughs> I think it adds a lot of interesting things. Because we were just like we were just talking about. I think the reason that they added the faction shuffle up for the starting positions is because you know your faction is very much contained into those three starting hexes, and those are the only places you can go. If you want more variability without the possibility of being overpowered, I think this wins gambit is the kind of the middle ground, where you can kind of pick up your people and, and bring them out to a different hex where you can start producing something that you can't produce in your starting area without having to upgrade your mechs. It gives you another option. What about you, Aaron? I don't know if I've played enough with this expansion to say much about it. Um, I, I think I would like to play more of it uh, before I can decide if I would need it or not. Didn't you hear our episode about first impressions? Just do it. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> Discard it. <laughs> no, but it's all right. So obviously I kind of want to lead up to the big expansion, which is the Rise of Fenris. So the last expansion I wanted to mention, there's another one where they add encounter cards, additional encounter cards. I don't know, Adam, if we, during our play of Rise of Fenris, we played with these encounter cards, but they add a little more weird effects. Usually the encounter cards are just gain a pretty good benefit. The new encounter deck focuses a lot on like, here's a weird way to do something or a random effect. I actually dislike this expansion, not because I don't like the abilities in the encounter cards, but sometimes just like, oh, pay two reputation for a mech, it's just too strong. So like if your opponent draws something really strong and you draw like, oh, you can do this wacky thing for one turn. It's just like, okay, but I'd rather just have a mech for like two popularity. <laughs> so that's the only reason I, I don't necessarily like the expansion. And maybe if I played only with those encounters and not mix them in with the basic encounters, I would like it a little better. But I've only played it by mixing them in with the main encounters, and it has that flaw, I think, in that game. I don't know if you guys got into play with those like encounter cards that I'm talking about. I don't think I have. All right. And then finally, then, the very last expansion is Rise of Fenris. This is the Scythe Legacy, but really Scythe Campaign. And there's a whole story arc to it. Does anyone know the story for Rise of Fenris? I don't. Does Aaron? Yeah, I think we all skipped the story. <laughs> but the main thing that was there, um, I think at some point you're trying to save Tesla's daughter from Rasputin and Rasputin's a bit. There is a story that's actually in the rule book, and it's pretty expansive. They go through like five pages or something like that of the like 16 page rule book is all the, the story behind the whole Rise of Fenris. So I think it's a, you know, for people that like that kind of thing, it's a, it's really well done. They did a good job with it. And also the Automa project folks are on this too. So if people, for people that like that kind of thing too, there's Automa option as well. That's why we skipped it because it's a fucking long story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a couple of pages long. And then what he does is he does a summary of it. And then you can read the accelerated summary of it. So you can be like, all right, you can read the five pages. Maybe you can read the one page or you can read the one sentence if you really don't <laughs> yeah. care at all. And that's what we did. We just read like the one sentence. <laughs> so yeah, there's an expansive story. I like that he puts that lore into the game. It's kind of neat. Talking about that, the Rise of Fenris, it adds the legacy version. And it does it in a way that I love, which is a lot of the time I felt like some legacy games tried to be legacy just to be legacy. When they could maybe get away with not being legacy. So something like Gloomhaven, I complained about it where I was like, you know what? If he really wanted to, Gloomhaven didn't have to be legacy. And Rise of Fenris is the example of that where you can have all those secret boxes, you can have all that exploration, and then you can have it easily be set up again. I played it twice already, and I enjoyed it both times, and I didn't have to buy a whole new set to enjoy it. So I really like the way this was played out in the form of that campaign. So playing it has a campaign. Before we get into like maybe individual chapters and mechanics, what was your feeling overall? So let's go with Aaron first. I really liked the campaign. It was a lot of fun. It was fun wondering what was going to happen in the next game. I guess I don't know if you would get that same wondering aspect if you were replaying it. I liked that you could have different mech mechanics added and you can buy extra mechanics and you can choose which direction you want the next game to go. I think every game has influence tokens on the board and whoever collects the most influence has more of a vote no i think it was on like two games that had those okay yeah 
important one was, well, I think we're going to get to it, talk about, it's going to be when you branch between war or peace, right? And it shapes the next like four chapters or five chapters that you play. Adam, what, what, what are your thoughts? I would not recommend this for somebody who's like their first time or is just <laughs> starting to play it. Yeah, yeah. I think you should at least have played the game twice, three times, five times and gotten to the point where you're comfortable with understanding what all the factions do and how the game works before you actually start playing this Rise of Fenris. But beyond that, I agree with everything that Aaron said. I like the wonder and the exploration and the kind of like the how the story develops from the gameplay perspective. But I wasn't a big fan of the scoring and the progression on that end as far as the acceleration of the yeah. win- leader above and beyond the rest of the players. I think what you said is exactly right. I, I love this expansion, but I think this expansion should really be played with people that are either all at the same level or at least try to have everyone be comfortable with most factions. Not it doesn't have to be every faction, but be comfortable with most factions because so I played with Aaron on one campaign and I played with you on one campaign. Mm-hmm. And on our campaign, Adam, one player had never played before at all. Yes. And then the other one played like once or twice and I'd played Yeah. I'd exactly. played maybe twice or three times at that point and you you'd played yeah. many times. Exactly. So like we played one game to kind of like, okay, here's how that game works. And when we jump in and then it, it's just kind of like downhill because every game you're getting either rewards or something. Not necessarily when you win, you just have to unlock stuff to get rewards. And two of the players, because they were not experienced with it, they weren't getting many rewards. So mm-hmm. I was doing good. And then I snowballed to victory way too much mm-hmm. because by the time they started understanding how to play properly, how to invest resources properly and just like really just how the game works. Mm -hmm. It was by game four, three or four. And by then that's three or four games. I already knew how to play that. I got, it got me to just snowball way too high. So by game like six and seven, I could have just sit out on the last three games and still would have won with the amount of points I had and the amount of resources I had. There was no catch up available at all. For that reason, I, I would play through the campaign mode like once just so you, progressively unlock the stuff you know get that exposure and that excitement but then personally i would not play through the campaign again because i do not enjoy that part of the campaign with the snowballing and the scoring and all of that but i would play these as modules and and that i would enjoy so the group i played with aaron i think we all already had played multiple times so we were all somewhat comfortable with scythe so i I think i still won on that one but not at all by as much as I won with the other game. Yeah, Aaron, maybe you can comment on your maybe you comment on your uh, experience through the campaign. I think I might have been in a similar situation. I fell behind early on, and I, I had trouble catching up. I was the green faction for most of it, I think. Okay. And I wasn't sure exactly how to play it. I was going to say, was this your very first time playing the green faction? This might have been like the second time. Okay. I think actually a couple games in... We realized we were counting the points from the flags of the green faction incorrectly. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Kind of easy to fall behind. You have this triumph log where you log the stars that you complete. And if you fill up a row or a column, you get extra bonuses at the end. Yeah. I don't think I fully understood how important that was. Like you, I think I really liked the modules. I think I would play through the campaign again, though, now that I kind of have a better handle on how it would work. I think Gmo mentioned this before, but in our campaign, he told this story before. I was the one who he stole the iron from twice in a row. Oh. <laughs> trying to, trying yeah. to build a mech twice in a row. <laughs> oh, man. I had my quote-unquote engine set up that I could just go produce enough iron to make a mech and then make a mech and then again produce enough iron to make a mech and make a mech so that was stolen from me twice i think that might have been the most angry i've ever been in a board game (laughs) but did you throw it on the ground or no no okay 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 (laughs) i did feel bad doing that yeah but it, it it's tough because if you don't have a mech like i was the you know it's the slow faction my character didn't have enough speed to make it back to protect. So I thought, why oh. bother protecting? I'll just try again to make a mech. 
<laughs> and it didn't work out. Oh my god! Yeah, that, I think if anything, in that campaign that we played, I think that's the campaign that really sealed the deal for you, though, to lose like the campaign. Because I think after that, you literally it literally made you waste like four or five turns of the game that you tried to build up to a mech. I take it away. You tried to do it again. I take it away again. And then you know, a sack is not one of those games where you have. Oh, I lost a couple of turns. Let me just make him up. It's like the game doesn't have that many turns at all in general. Mm-hmm. So if I tell you, hey, you're going to lose five turns of the game, it's a big fucking deal. So I remember this correctly because this was pretty early on. This was like game maybe three. Right after this game, you didn't get like any stars. You didn't get anything because like I, it was really critical that I took those stuff from you. And kind of like we're saying about this campaign, and I, I do agree the one flaw this campaign has is it's not necessarily snowball. It's more like there's no catch up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the issue. It's unless they fuck up and you can take the lead, there's no real way for like somebody to catch up from behind if everyone's still doing the same. So when you get fucked over here on one game, well, if it's a re- in your case, it was a pretty bad fuck up. Like, not fuck up. Like, I went in and took a lot of the stuff from you. It was hard for you to be like, all right, one full game out of a campaign of like eight games or something. It's just gone. It was like, great. Now, like, you're one game behind from everybody else. And I think that's how it felt for you for most of the remainder of the campaign. Yeah, that 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 was it. I think it's kind of my fault that I couldn't catch up because you have a couple of opportunities in the game to switch your faction. And sometimes mm-hmm. it might be a good idea to do that. I think we had five players in the seven. So if you switch a faction, you're starting in a different spot. And maybe you can start somewhere be able to catch up a little bit that way Mm -hmm. but i think a lot of the problem too is that the abilities or whatever that you can gain or buy are there for the winner and it's harder for the people who are losing to gain those abilities either one off or for the future in order to start to try to catch up so i feel like that also it gives advantage to the person that's already winning to make them win even harder yeah, well, that's what I'm getting at, right? So one of the issues that, like, that you have, and like the game that I was just talking about with Aaron that we experienced, right? Someone like the Triumph Lug or whatever it's called, where you put all this, like, the little X's on. If you get one star in a game and somebody else gets six stars, that's a huge leap, right? Yeah, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about like the single game benefit, the minor benefits that you can get. Like the you can upgrade your max abilities, right? And you can upgrade... There's like one-off abilities or what, or those permanent abilities that you get that make you like pay less for something or whatever. So just to wrap up about the campaign in general, I love the campaign. I've done it twice. I'll probably do it again, but I think it's important that you do it. And I, I would highly recommend it to a group of people that if you're playing Scythe a lot and are like evenly match, I think it's going to be a blast because it's very different from Scythe, but you still get all the Scythe goodness from it. I think a lot of the issues that we have you know, it could be something like even one player can throw off the balance. I would not do it again, even if just one player is just not as familiar at Scythe as everybody else. Because they're like, you know, it's just like any other legacy game. You sign yourself up for like nine games and, you know, you do bad on like one and then you just fall behind. You're not going to have fun for the next like eight of them. I would make some kind of house, house or modification. I was just thinking about it, like kind of trying to brainstorm. I think... Maybe you could do like a draft of the abilities, like you reveal one for every player and then you draft them like worst to first or something like that. Because I think that the the structure that they have in there for the game to game modifications really benefits the person that's in first, I think. I'm going to disagree with that because, uh, just because on the game I played with Aaron, Aaron did bad, but everybody else was doing okay. Aaron did bad literally because of that game. I don't know, you can defend yourself, Aaron. I don't know if that was a really like the root cause. But like all I'm going to say is like at the end of the game, Every other player was also having all the upgrades. I wasn't getting more upgrades than other players. And I wasn't actually winning on all of the other rounds, right? So, like, at one point, I played with the Black Faction. And twice, we tied with other players. And we were getting, like, very similar benefits. So, I, I, that's, a, that's the only reason I would disagree. But this is the reason I'm going to say with the caveat, right? Of, like, combat is not a big thing in Scythe, but it can be. And if multiple players target one player, you know, in a regular non-campaign game, that's fine because it's like, all right, everyone target Adam. Okay, whatever. You know, then you should start another game. But if you do that in like a campaign game and then Adam like loses significantly worse than other players, 
that's when it hits you because then you can't catch up. I agree that there's no real catch up mechanic there. So you're just behind all the time if someone does that to you. And that can happen inside if a group of people do it to you or if you make one bad game, kind of like what Aaron said, like that decision that he made, like, oh, I'll just leave my stuff open and try it again. And I'm just like, I'm just going to take it again. That one bad decision just like ruined that game. And now because there's no catch up mechanic, it just ruins all the future games. So that, that would be my caveat to what I said. I don't know, Aaron, I don't know if that's how you felt in the campaign we played. It felt like that like that was a really pretty big turning point. But I, I think I definitely did not play to the best of my ability for that campaign either. But yeah, I could see how, you know, it, it's really tough to catch up. I guess their attempt at trying to make a catch-up mechanic is by introducing the different factions throughout the campaign. Or like Aaron said, like you get to change, you can move around or change a different to a different faction. So do you think that's a handicap? Like the person that got the new faction is like getting a new faction is a handicap? Is that what you're saying? Mm, I think they're both very strong. But it does make you have to adapt and change your gameplay like mid-game. Mm-hmm. So I think it can work both ways. If you're really good at that faction, you can go from the bottom to being better because you're able to you know, take advantage of using that faction. But it could also go the other way too, where the person in first gets this faction and they were in first because they really understood how to play their faction and now they have to play this random one that they don't know how to play. Mm-hmm. So I think it could, it could go both ways. All right, is there any other topic you had in your uh, super awesome bulleted notes here that you wanted to touch on? I'm going to mention this real quickly. That, um, there's multiple ways to win in this game, and I think it's really cool that there's different strategies. And one of the things that comes in the original, I believe it's the original game, is a little log sheet that says like different challenges, like win a game without making any mechs. Mm-hmm. And I, we had players that had done that. We had a game where like one of our friends actually built no mechs and won the game. So I think it's cool that like that option is available and it's something like doable. And they actually have like a whole bunch of like achievements that are just you know you write their name on the paper and stuff that's so that was pretty cool too yeah it's like steam achievements it's cool instead of writing it in the in the lid of your box you just actually they put a place for it yep yep it was pretty neat adam do you have anything else before maybe we go to like final thoughts or something we can go to final thoughts final thoughts so i already talked enough about this game myself i defended against adam's criticism no matter what so <laughs> but for me it's always a buy i love scythe i think that's such a, it's a solid game. It's just streamlined. It's, it's easy. And you can just like get it to the table pretty easily. You can set it up pretty easily. Everyone understands it. Talking about expansions more and more, I do think get comfortable with the base game first before you jump to the expansion. That would be my suggestion. I think there's a lot of play in the main box. There's a lot of nice components. There's a lot of stuff you need to learn. All the factions play very differently. So I would get really used to that. And then I would maybe start researching factions. But otherwise, for me, Scythe is a buy. And I own all the expansions, even though I think some of them are mediocre but I, I do enjoy it so why don't we go Aaron what are your thoughts I really like this game I, I said it was my favorite game I don't know if there's any game that's really like grabbed me and this is absolutely my favorite game but I pretty much would never turn down a game of Scythe I think it works all the time the theme is really cool 1920s it's not quite steampunk it's not quite diesel punk it's something in between I like the way it plays is it's, it's kind of like the worker placement aspect where you're just thinking through the steps of how you're going to play and you can think multiple turns ahead, but you can kind of be flexible too about it. Adam? Yeah, for me, this is, it kind of teeters right on the edge, but I'll, I'll call it a buy, I guess. I think it has enough for me where there's a lot of strategy, but a lot of tactics too. And you have to really adjust your plans based on what's going on in the map. And to like the point you guys talked about earlier, right, where you can steal resources from people. It really creates a different effect that a lot of other games don't have. So you you have to be a lot more conservative and cautious and it rewards people for being more aggressive. Mm-hmm. And I really like that aspect of the game one of the main things i really don't like actually is the encounters and how random they are like you were talking about gmo like adding the additional expansion of of encounters and making it even more swingy would not be my best idea of what this game could look like but that's why i kind of like the wind gambit expansion because i think it gives a little bit more consistency to being able to play the game the way that you want to play it yeah as opposed to having to rely on the encounters or rely on 
the behavior of the other players to do what you want to do. Oh, wow, that's cool. That like I, I don't think we've gotten a under the lid where everyone was like a buy on like <laughs> on a game. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really good. Yeah, no, that's cool. All right, so now we're just waiting for Scythe Rise of Fenris to be on Steam so we can uh, actually yes, play it so we can play it yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to quickly wrap it up, mm-hmm. like I played online with Adam. That's how we figured out that I was taking the longest. I always thought oh, I was yep. in that game too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah Aaron was there too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, how do you guys like play it online? I don't mind it. I, I like Scythe in general. I like playing it in person better, but I don't mind. And I don't know if you guys have any other different opinions. What do you think, Aaron? It's a lot easier to kind of play online because a game can be a kind of a pain to set up by putting all the stuff in your board, you know. And other than that, the thing I didn't like is that, I think Adam, you warned us before we started playing how easy it was to... <laughs> choose the wrong option (laughs) and how you can't Mm -hmm. take it back Uh, i think Mm -hmm. i think something in general for online games there needs to be something like say oh i misclicked you guys can we all like uh, vote that i can take this move back and then like i can actually do what i meant to do yeah the ui is very punishing in that in that respect and i did not enjoy that but I did enjoy the fact that, you know, there are a lot of pieces to this game and they're all on the board. I don't enjoy moving my fat stack of wood, my fat <laughs> stack of metal onto the next space every time I want to move. So I do think that the game did a good job of, even though it's a lot of clicking and a lot of small things, I did I do think the game did a good job of that and being better about displaying exactly what's where. Sometimes, you know, I don't want to say that stuff blends into the board, but sometimes it's hard to see what's where. Mm-hmm. when you're playing in person and i think that the computer game actually did a very good job of highlighting who controls which territories and what resources are on those territories and what mechs or what persons are on that territory as well what you just said i think it was like literally an issue that even like jamie noticed because if you remember the board is double sided so that one side of the board is a regular board if you flip it over it's like a large version of the board because it gets mm-hmm. fucking crowded right you have oh i have yeah. three mechs four workers eight resources and my character and i gotta move one space and you gotta keep it all in one hex right <laughs> yeah so like they clearly found it an issue like it's obvious like i never play with the small version the extended board is like 10 bucks so i usually buy it it gets tight it's like so much stuff on yeah. that board yeah you're right that, that is a nice part of the online version i like the online version they did a good implementation of it all right anything else that's it for me Aaron, thanks for joining us. I didn't realize that was your favorite game, so I'm glad it worked out. (laughs) (laughs) And thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm a big fan. Yep. Hell yeah, absolutely. Everyone, thank you for listening. And the end. And they lived happily ever after. Thank you for listening to Under the Lid, produced by Rattail. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Rattail Games. And also you can email us at rattailgames at gmail.com. Visit our website, www.rattail.com. Music by Bruno Barrera at Bruno Bar on SoundCloud. Edited and hosted by Adam Tebow and Gima Barrera. Thanks for listening, and continue our story next time. can't believe you guys don't have, like, any notes or anything. <laughs> 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 Aaron came here thinking it's a professional podcast and here we are I'm like alright let's bring it <laughs> <laughs> well it sounds so good when you release it I thought <laughs> oh, now you know now you know now exactly you know what's editing. going on <laughs> <laughs> we're full of it we're just fake it <laughs> but we cut the faking it out part out so you don't hear it <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly everyone thinks we're so smart <laughs>